I'm Kashi Soledi Kha, and um, yeah, thank you very much for, for having me this morning. I, 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 I kind of, yeah, I responded to this theme of dare. I, I kind of was like, what, what, what do I say? What do I mean? What does it mean? I thought like daring do, dare devils, risk taking, a lot of evil Knievel, you know, you, you capers like Ocean's Eleven, you know, so I, I and I, I, I realized that living anywhere, but especially in South Africa, you have to dare to do things because they mostly haven't been done yet, right? Because it's such a we, we, it's such a new space, you know, and a new for for you know for, since my days at university to now, I'm constantly seeing all these people that are doing things, and they're kind of like these trailblazers in these spaces, and it you know it just hasn't been done before. I remember when the guys when I was living in. Cape Town and the guys who started Vida Cafe were like the first guys to sort of make a coffee, you know, a coffee shop chain. And I was like, yeah, wow, yeah. It was just like almost like we we're discovering coffee for the first time. So it's it's very exciting. We're like this young nation just not never had coffee and now it, it's happening. Um, um so well, yeah, when I thought about it, and I thought of the kid this daring and where does this start? When did I kind of start? being this risk, risk taker. And, and I thought of a fun moment when I was, I was 15, um, turning 16, and my parents had just divorced like a year or two before that. And um, we, we, we my, my mother and my sister and I were living in a place called Acadia in Pretoria. Just, we, we had been living in a township in Sosham Gube and I actually before that, but now living in Acadia, which was sort of at the bottom of Mankey's Cop, which is where the union buildings were, you know, and apartheid had just ended, which sounds like epic, but it also kind of shows how recent it was, you know, um, uh, and it was Nelson Mandela's inauguration. I was like a bored 15 year old. So I went up, I walked up to Mankey's Cop and it was packed. It was like security. You can imagine it's like they don't know what's going to happen. This is the first like black president or the first democratically um, elected president. Um, uh, there could be like radicals that are coming to blow up the place. Who knows? So there's like heavy security, soldiers, cops, oh, you know? And, and so I woke up there, but then they were planning the, the party, the Nelson Mandela sort of inauguration concert. So there was like a village at the bottom of this place with like tents and all these like famous people, celebrities, South African performers, you know, Yvonne Chaka Chaka, uh, uh, Johnny Clegg, Hima Sakela, just like you name them, they were all there. But I was this kid, I was far away, I couldn't get in. And I really, there was something, this urge, this yearn to go be part of it, you know? Um, uh, I wasn't really be, like interested in being there the next day for the actual party. I just wanted to be like in that behind the scenes world in the in the preparation. And I don't know like what got over me. There was a, like a, a troop of Chinese dancers who came with a dragon, you know those, Chinese dragons, it was a rehearsal day. So they came with this like dragon and I'd never seen it in real life. And I think to be honest, I'd never seen actual Chinese people in real life either. Like, like not that many at the same time because I was in Pretoria, I just moved from social Google. Where do you see that many Chinese uh, people with a dragon, you know? So so I offered at that, I, I kind of like had this urge and then I was like, ah, cause like there's security and you can see there's heavy security checks. So I offered to help with the with the dragon, I carried the dragon, and as they were walking in, I took a stick of the dragon, and then I went in, and and, uh, um, and that's how I got into the place. And then next thing you know, I had like freedom of the space in there. I was walking about, I was seeing celebrity. I was like this crazy fifteen year old. I'm probably very dirty as well, but I was in the mix, you know. And I I never forgot that because it was so exhilarating that that feeling of just being able to do that. And then a year later. I had to go to university. I started like university where I went to UCT. I think I left Pretoria when I was 17. And I'd never left, obviously, uh, Pretoria uh, at, by, by that time. I think I'd been to Durban once when I was ah, maybe a year before on holiday with like a school trip. And then a few years before that with my parents. But that was the extent of my worldliness. You know, I was now about to hit Cape Town, son. They were about to, yeah, see some guy who'd never left Pretoria before. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, um, I, 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 I was accepted. I actually was going to study architecture. That was my first choice. You know, I, even though my real choice was, was to study drama, my first choice was architecture because it was more of a real thing. Like to, to, to you know, to my, for my parents or my mom to be paying for 
for school fees or for university tuition, it felt like it's a better thing to just have her do study architecture. But I didn't get in because my math was so bad. And I really, really wanted to be like to study film. Actually, my, my ideal was to go to New York City, to go to NYU or something to, to study to study film, but um, Cape Town was the furthest away from Pretoria I could get, you know, on the budget that, that we had. So, so when I, when, so when I got accepted, when I got accepted into university, they called me, they said, look, we, we can accept you, but we, we ran out of like res, we ran out of like accommodation. So unless you can prove that you have accommodation, uh, we can't accept you at this university. So I said, okay, okay. And I dropped the phone and then I paced up and down in my mom's living room. And then I picked up the phone again. I said, yes, I've got accommodation. Um, I sorted, I uh, think I'll be, I found like a, a, a youth hostel, like a backpackers somewhere in, in gardens. And uh, I got the address of that. And I gave that address as my, my, my accommodation in Cape Town. And the lady at admin at UCT bought it. And that was that. I was, I was off. I got on a inter-Cape bus and went to, <laughs> and went to went to Cape Town, you know. So that was, you know, like again, like this idea of oh my God, I didn't know anything. I my mom also, she, you know, because she's yeah, she's just kind of going, okay, you go to university, good luck, you know. Here's four hundred bucks. Um, go get him, Tiger. Um, so, so then I was off, and it, it was it was like just a crazy experience because it was the most amount of diversity I'd been, I'd been exposed to at the time. I was grateful for taking that risk. It was just one of those things of if, you know, I could have said, no, let me go to the University of Pretoria, be close to my mom and my family, and this is the vibe. So it was like these small things that I kind of appreciate now where I go, oh man, if I didn't kind of take that leap. And it was, it was intense. It was very, like every kind of month of it was a lot of fun but it was also extremely intense because my my mom who broke you know my mom couldn't afford to have, uh, be taking both me eventually my sister also joined me at UCT and we were freestyling it my sister was a lot more deserving of university tuition from my mom because she was a smarter more diligent student and everything um and um uh, and I was not I kind of like truly really was you, you know it, I gave I heard that there were students who go to university for seven years, six years, doing the same sort of degree and all of that kind of stuff. And I was like, no, the fuck am I going to do that? I'm going to do three years. I'm going to do it. And then there because in the black student community, there was like, yeah, he did it in record time. I was like, what do you mean record time? Like, it just, it, it's three years. It shouldn't it take three years? Um, so I gave three years, and I, but I didn't realize that your, the record timeness of the self-discipline of being a, like a higher education student, you can't just be like, you know, on your own. But also I was discovering this freedom for the first time. So I wasn't going to just be like this kind of student. I, I also wanted to be free, you know? And like, I eventually ended up staying with like these 30 something year old um, uh, Africans guys from Bloemfontein that were like also super exciting. Like uh, a, a guy called Peter Bester who, who, was a diamond diver. So he had a house in Woodstock that he had, you know, those companies like executive outcomes and those crazy mining companies. So he, he dove for, for minerals. And then I think he had stuck one in the in bomb or swallowed one, but then he, he made, he had, he, he kind of had his startup capital. So he had this beautiful house and he was buying a farm somewhere. So I was living in digs in this beautiful, um, uh, in this beautiful, like sort of before before Woodstock was gentrified, you know, I was living in this beautiful house that Peter Bester had built with his own hands. And when my sister came, um, I, I kind of encouraged her to move in with me. My sister was a very clever student, but also a creative. But so when when she it was her time to study, she got into engineering, and I knew that it was bad for her. She was wearing white denim and white denim Levi's and and um. Uh, and Timberlands, she was, that was her style, you know? And then I was just like, no, that's not the one wrong. Cause I, when I already had dreadlocks, I had a, a pierced ear and I was like, you, no, this is not you. And cause she's always been like the writer and the sort of, she wrote stories and all of that kind of stuff. And then a year later she was doing like a media studies degree and she's just kind of had her short film go to some of the best film festivals in the world. And she won at, the, at Diff now. So it was like, and we were together creatively as well. So that leap, you know, I, I can't imagine us working together in the engineering world 
getting government tenders to build bridges in Limpopo, that would be, I'd probably be very like annoying and probably a, a little bit more overweight. Not to say that people who do government tenders in engineering are overweight and boring, but I would be, I know myself, I would be one of those, you know? So, 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 so that was, that was the, the thing. I remember like living, like the, so Peter Best, the, the sort of owner of the house, he would leave and he would, um, uh, his friend from Bloemfontein called Ian van der Valt came. He was like, I think Nicolas Cage, but from Bloemfontein, uh, like in that movie, Living Las Vegas. So he, he kind of came and he had, he had, it was, of course, for me, I also had never encountered a 30 something year old African guy. These guys had been to the army. They had those kind of stories, you know? So my perspective of, uh, of that kind of world was also like, yo, like, you know, you guys are part data, you guys are racist, and they also kind of had their story and we lived together and we shared, you know? So it was a very interesting and enlightening time, especially with Ian van der Waals, who was this like, like entrepreneur. He was always trying interesting things, like weird things with hippies, you know, growing weed illegally in the back, right, in the backyard. And he taught me how to drive. My first kind of driving lesson is he took me in his little Fiat Uno because he Ian, Ian van der Waal was a true risk taker as well because he inspired me because I was a, you know, when 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 I met him, he had the one thing he, he kept saying is I'll just excuse you, I just lost, I used to be a millionaire. I lost a I lost a million. I lost a million. And he had he had literally just lost a million and he was kind of trying to 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 make his way up. You know, he was trying to so there, he had all these like hustles um, uh, which were very um uh, like in the creative world, you know, he had like these people who were making tie dyed uh, like shirts. He had like, these people who were making these canvas art freaking in pieces. Um, you know, weird like lots of weed being consumed, but also a lot of industry. You know, and he taught me he, he taught me how to drive. I remember my first driving lesson. He said, "You have driven to So we drove to to Scarborough to get oys to get our muscles. And you know, you only allowed fifty. I mean, twenty five a man at the time. Um, uh, but then he convinced me, you know, I, I was also that I invited all the, all, mostly the, the, the females from my class at drama school to come to the house because we had this killer pad, you know, we didn't have any money, but if we could get it, all the muscles, cook the muscles, garlic butter, then everybody could drink wine and we have like a really good party. Everybody's impressed and we're like, wow, these guys, you know, so, but when he taught me how to drive, he gave me a bottle of Tassenberg. And he said, okay, down. And we were on the, you know, driving from Scarborough, Cape Town can be very mountainy on these roads. He gave me this bottle, friggin' chug this down. And then as soon, I think I just downed half a bottle of Tassenberg red wine. And then he said, okay, cool. Now get in the, and that was the greatest, easiest way to learn how to drive because I was so relaxed, but probably the most dangerous as well. Still keeping with the daring do and the crazy evil Knievel vibes, you know? So, 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 so as, as my my three my sort of uh, three years of university was coming to a to an end, not that I was finishing my degree, but I was kind of the three years it didn't match the my progress academically, and I kind of knew I had to you know I I already had a plan of what I wanted to do you know um, I was and like as early as, as high school as as um, uh, standard nine I don't know what they call it grade eleven I was sure that I wanted to be a stand up comedian. Um, um, like Woody Allen, who's a bad example now, but he was an awesome example back in the day. And um, Bill Cosby, who's a really terrible example now, but he was an awesome example back in the day. And uh, and make films, you know. So 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 now I kind of the, the thing that was very strong in my mind was I wanted to do a comedy sketch show. Um, I I it, you know I wanted to I'd seen in Living Color, um, Saturday Night Live, Monty Python. And I thought that South Africa needed that kind of thing because it was still in the icebreaker stage. You know, like the, 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 as soon as I discovered stand-up, I was one of the first black guys, myself and David Cow, um, uh, you know, Riyad Musa and uh, Mark Lottering. We, and it was this kind of ice-breaking. We were always in these white comedy clubs or the one, you know, just restaurants. And the, the Cape Comedy Collective was, Kind of, the, it was this couple that came from England, and they were they're also risk takers. I mean, now their their latest risk was they they have like a a truck, a bus made out like that runs on biodiesel, and they drive them all over Africa. So they come they come from England to South Africa to start stand up comedy as like a culture. Not that there wasn't stand up comedy; there were already people like Mike. Mike I mean, uh, what's his name? Um, give me 
old Jewish guy, uh, Larry, Larry, that guy. Um, uh, he's in one of my movies. I can't believe uh, he's so old that I've forgotten him. Um, Cyril Green, um, uh, but the, the guy, he, he says kind of crazy racist things a lot, but we take it because, you know, he's from that generation. Uh, he's from that generation, so racist. Um, uh, uh, Mel Miller, Mel Miller. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, so, so um, you know, um, and my cousin, Perry Hilton, all those kind of people that did, but when Cape Comedy Collective came, they came with a kind of co comedy club culture that kind of they'd grown up in in, in in England and they started the Cape Comedy Collective. So we were in this like, yeah, my cousin, my cousin. And so we, we were, we were, we were that part of that experiment. It was like a crazy thing where you're like, you know, it's two Wednesday night, you're all cleaned up and you go perform, you go do stand up at Dirty Dicks, uh, uh, you know, like in, 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 in Hout Bay, where it's like to a bunch of fishermen who had never seen a black guy sort of speaking anything apart from Fagalo's type. So it was, it was really kind of very like, <laughs> very kind of scary, but also very interesting because the, the concept of, for some places they were like, okay, cool, yeah, we know comedy, we know stand up comedy, we know comedians, but most of the time it was, a new idea. People who are in a restaurant come to eat, and then all of a sudden, there's a guy going, "Excuse me, uh, the comedy is going to start in five minutes." And many of you guys have eaten and had your drinks, and then people are there to to chat. You know, they're there to kind of this is their one night out to chat with their friends, and now you ask suddenly asking them to keep quiet and listen to you, and they're like, "What the hell? Why?" You know. So that war with the audio, that first encounter was war. We were kind of almost sometimes getting moored or you know like where somebody's like if you i will worry you my friend i will worry you not here <laughs> and you're always looking for somebody um anybody can help you know so that that was the beginnings of comedy uh, and like stand my stand-up experience and it went but it was that thing of like the icebreaker like it was literally an icebreaker because as soon as people realized that you know you're one side you're about to get killed by some guy and then you have to make them laugh quickly and then as soon as the whole room starts laughing they realize oh this guy's here to make us laugh hold on shh, let's listen to him you know and then you're consistently making them laugh and then you bring on the next guy and then the next guy then by the end of the night they're like oh my god what was that eh? that was really nice you guys eh? there's something here you know so that became that's how we started stand up, you know? And then eventually when I moved to Joburg and David Cow was like also kind of insisting all the time with Sam Hendrix uh, who brought the Cape, the Cape, the International Comedy Festival in Cape Town, which is at, at one point, the second biggest comedy festival in the Southern Hemisphere where you would see some of the best acts in the world, you know, um, Jimmy Carr, like all these guys, you know, Ross Noble and so on and so forth. So it was also a great place to experience comedy because uh, you're, you're learning to do comedy. And at the same time, you're seeing some of the most, even though you don't know about them, you know, you, you realize you're spending time with all these people at a festival and then two, three, four years later, they're like breaking out internationally as some of the biggest comedians in the world. So it was also kind of reinforcing and heartening, but it was just like also the break-in was very interesting. So from that idea, I was like, hey man, if we put this on TV, if these ideas that David Carr has in his head, Koki Falco, you know, Jason Cope, myself, of Tepa Mokhale, if we made a comedy sketch show, like now that would be awesome. If we put that on TV and it was kind of like this, like mostly black South African perspective, but also very South African, you know, like the, the idea, because at the beginning I was like, yeah, we're going to tell the hood to the world. And then as soon as I was living in Cape Town for a year, I was like, yo, we're going to tell South Africa to do it. Because now I'm like, I was chilling with Muslim guys, with Jewish guys, with this, the idea of my idea of the world. I'm like, this is crazy. And South Africa needs to hear this so that, you know, we can maybe be a better place. And so eventually we, I saw uh, Salto Copley and Simon Hansen had a company that was doing interesting things. We convinced them to shoot a pilot with money that we got from Sam Hendricks. Uh, and, you know, they kind of, you know, they shot two sketches and it fizzled out. And then um, I, I think a year or two passed and I met a guy called John Day who runs a big production company in, in Cape Town now, very successful. Um, uh, he, he then came and said, but back then he was also just a kid like me. And he said, oh yeah, I also want to do a sketch show. So he had some sketches, we shot some sketches. And then 
um, uh, nothing happened. You know, like for, the, for so every year, every day when and like I had friends who used to say I was broke. I was like living in a commune with other guys who had great ideas of like be becoming uh, internet service providers, rappers, music producers. I was going to be this kind of media mogul and we're all living in the same house. And I think I can blame this original stash of the worst weed in the world that came in a black garbage bag, right? With a friend whose plan was he would he was gonna sell this and set himself up. He came with his also his 300 bucks and he spent that 300 bucks on this bag of like um, uh, jut. And we 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 had this house. The rent was big. <laughs> there was like like lots of rent. There was this warehouse in the back of the house, which was weird. Like it was a house, and then attached our backyard was like a warehouse where I think there used to be a printing place. So it was crazy luck. We used to throw parties in there as well. So you can imagine our business ideas were not. I'm uh, gonna be fully formed as in in a way that we we thought there would be because of that that jet. But that space, I remember then that group of people went and we the, a guy called Breeze Wisa Yoko. I actually saw him on a video. He's a, a great uh, uh, street artist. He's now an internationally renowned uh, street artist. He's a very good friend of mine. And then he said, "Hey, why don't we?" He was part of that. He was part of that weed stash. And then he said, why don't we make a thing called the revolution? You know, we take all these creative people um, uh, in, in, in the city that we inter interact with, all these people that are smoking our jet beach, let's take them to a hall in Sowetin, um, uh, Langa, and let's do this thing called the revolution. And then, so all the kids from university came. It was this eclectic bunch of you know, UCT, privileged UCT kids that went into Langa in a hall and we did this show, you know, and some kids from UCT also came. I did stand up. Breeze and his people rapped, some guy did poetry, another guy sang and all of that kind of stuff. So it also made us feel that it was a risky endeavor because it was like, who's going to come? Some people came, but it, again, it was that kind of thing that it made us believe that, hey, if you put your thing to it, you know, you things work out. You just take a risk. They're like, where you go, um, uh, like people, we, we find out about luck. I mean, unless you kind of got missed by a bullet, that kind of luck. Um, uh, most type of luck is the luck of risk taking, right? It's like the guy went and jumped over a thing, a cliff, and then you're like, he's crazy. And then he jumped right in the, the thing, the, the, the point that he was going to try to jump into, or was it a boat, was it like a, a big inflatable raft, whatever it is, but he did it and he could have missed and fallen in the water or into the, the, the freaking sharp rocks or whatever. And, and so that, that, that was kind of that experience, that point. And then I ended up, my experiences led me to more risk-taking types. So I met Fred Joe when I left Joe, Cape Town. When I, I was, I still every day for four years, I thought, yeah, we're going to get Pure Manati show, that show that I want to make, this sketch show that I was broke and I was owing rent and I had to do all sorts of weird things like forge bank um, um, bank statements and bank receipts to show to the landlord to say, hey, the money's going to clear, the money's going to clear. And the last row, the, the literally me moving out of Cape Town was the landlord eventually came after two months or three months of no rent. And I kept quiet. You know, I was living in an observatory. We were all quiet in the house. Shh. We were working. We had like a workstations. It was like a business, almost like what a design business would look like now because we were trying to do all these making pitch decks and all of that kind of stuff. But we couldn't afford rent um, uh, because it was coming. And people would be like, why don't you just go? work at Ops Cafe as a waiter and then earn some money and blah, 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 blah. Like, what Ops Cafe? We are entrepreneurs. Have you not read Wired Magazine? That's where we're going to be, baby. Not at Ops Cafe. <laughs> so eventually, eventually the, 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 they came and we didn't open, but I guess they could hear there was somebody inside. So they started undoing the locks. And we had all sorts of cool things, our nice speakers, our beautiful collection of music, things, you know, that we had collect posters and we jumped out the window and we jumped into the back. The, I remember we never met the neighbors. So we, when we come over, these two black guys coming over the wall, you already think crime, you know? And I remember having to explain to the white neighbors that no, actually, because I was scared and I, I realized that they're scared. So I told them this whole story. Yeah, we like young entrepreneurs and we didn't pay rent and I, 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 the landlord is here. And then they chuckled and they let us through. <laughs> and they let us through. And that was, that was, that was that. I remember the next part of it, I was in a train um, like going to Cape, going in what was what I thought was stylish with these clothes from a used 
like a second hand shop. Um, they were actually like girl clothes, but I thought it was very cool to kind of put on. When I get to Joburg, they're gonna think, wow, how cool is this guy? So uh, it wasn't to be. Um, I, I, I took a, 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 a third class train ride to, 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 to Joburg and I worked for a guy, still no PMS. And I worked with, with Fred Joe, who was like a crazy risky guy. You know, he came out there um, uh, and he, he, he was, he actually was a UCT student uh, who had been raised in America and he was kind of like this vocal. I'd never seen anything like that before. He came to Joburg. He was part of starting this YFM um, radio station, which was like at the time, you know, there was like a cultural revolution happening and he was a big part of it. And he got a, a TV show. I remember when I saw his TV show from Cape Town, I was kind of bummed because I was like, hey, this guy's doing like a cool, funny show, like the one I want to make. Like, what the hell, man? You know, so I ended up working with him. He found me through David Kyle and, and I worked on this show and I was finally earning a living and I was living, you know, and then from there, I got this, you, I got to speak to the SABC. I kind of, they found my proposal that I had sent three, four years before because they had just found this new consultant who was going through like their material to see what's cool. And Fred Joe also said to me, yeah, you know, sketch comedy pff, doesn't work. Eh? Just, uh, you know, it's expensive. It's this, it's that. He was giving me the reason, but I was like, yeah, I still want to do it though, you know? Um, uh, Cause I was kind of saying to him, come with me, help, use your force to make, to help me do this thing. And he's like, it's not gonna work, forget that stuff. It's crazy idea, very costly South Africans, I'm gonna do be, you know? So I was like, you know what, forget you. Um, uh, then I, I, I remember being at work. I mean, he gave me such great opportunities like that, that. And I was working on his radio show as a, like a sidekick, you know, unofficially. I was like, oh, wow, I'm actually like a sidekick. Um, uh, it was funny, it was really good. And it was great for my profile because I'm on radio every day. Um, but it was also annoying because I didn't like be doing the same thing every day. Like, because you have to go to work at the radio, you have to go there every day, you know, which was, and I remember years later, uh, uh, Trevor Noah and, and David Kiruka were going to do a show on, on 94.7. And they were like, yo, so excited. And then I said to them, mm, you're going to, and you, they were both going to be comedians. They're both loving their stand up. And Trevor had this like ideas of kind of being this greatest comedian in the world. And I said, well, I don't know how you're going to do that if you're on radio every day. And um, so that was 94.7 loss. But now you also has a job that in, in prison every day. So I guess full circle. So anyway, I go, so I go to, so I come, I, I go to, 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 to the office, to the radio show one day, but this day I'm dressed up, you know, because I've got a meeting at the SABC, we're in the same building. I get there, they say, hey, we've seen the stuff that you do on, F on Fred Joe, and can you come and do that? We saw your proposal, this Pure Manati show, we like it. We think it's unbelievable, it's revolutionary. The woman was actually, she had consulted for the BBC. So when she found this show, she was like, oh, this is like the kind of thing that I like. So, so there, I, I got all these comedians. <laughs> I got all these comedians and we got to writing the show. And I mean, I, people, I, I, I got people to quit their jobs and people like Joey Ras Dean, Chris Forrest had real jobs with like real, like they had families, you know, a child and wife and they quit their jobs. And for another three or four or five months, as it would be, um, the SABC did not pay us. We didn't really have a contract. We just had the spirit, you know, but people had quit their jobs. So that was bananas. And I just had, it was all on me, you know, like, oh my God, um, uh, I, I made you guys take all these risks and now you can't pay rent and it's, oh my God, you know, because you can't go back. You can't exactly walk back to old mutual or Alexander Forbes and say, yeah, sorry guys, I'm back. Hey, you know, so, so, so now, yeah, it was crazy, but we pushed. And then eventually I remember getting a check with like multiple blocks, those old school checks for like the first, tranche which was like just over a million bucks and i was like 25 going into the bank like, ah, like thinking that they treat you differently with that but they didn't um, um but it was unbelievable so we we had the show you know like we we had the show and it was that kind of and everybody who came along and took the risk with me it, it paid off you know because this thing became this kind of cultural phenomenon of the time it was the time before like DSTV was making local content in the same way before there was the internet. Like, so prime time, that 10 a.m. slot with this crazy kind of like boundary pushing show, it was really like the thing. You know, I'd meet people, Jewish moms who 
said, yo, I don't leave. I can't leave because it's, 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 it's Sabbath on Friday. It's Shabbos. I can't be out of the house. So I have to watch this thing of yours. And I love it, you know? And then I meet Indian guys. We're like, yeah, I, I smoke some greens and I watch this thing, you know? So it was like this crazy, like multicultural thing that was, yeah. And then after that, the then we were able to jump into formal stand-up careers because we were famous, right, from TV. And we were able to say, like, come see us live. And people didn't know necessarily what that meant. Are they going to do these sketches of theirs? Um, but we had also planted on the show, we had this thing called Rocking the Rock, where the show was hosted in the kitchen. Like, my grandmother it was modeled on my grandmother's old kitchen. And we had this little, like, like boulder, this little rock that we would stand on as a stage and we would rock the rock, you know, um, and do stand up. And I guess that was like also getting people the idea of what stand up was. So from there, when we said, hey, we're doing a live show, people would come curiously um, and then we would do stand up and the rest is history, you know? And so that's how, and then that, that became like the way, like the kind of idea of stand up, um, um, the, the idea of risk. And I, I followed that every time. So every time I wanted to get money from people, where even if it's Netflix to do Queen Sono, I would, the first meeting I had with Netflix, I spoke about other things. And then they said, but what is that? I was like, oh, this, this I'm already doing. This I'm already like gonna pay for, where I'm gonna get everybody to, we, we, we're moving along with this. And they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Tell us more about the one you're moving along with, you know? And that, that's been the thing. Like, um, I made a film called Matwetwe, where we raised money. Within three weeks, we, we raised the money and we made the film ourselves. And it ended up going all over the world and kind of at festivals. And it came here and it ran for 12 weeks at the cinema, which is unprecedented, you know. So so that I will say that, you know, it's, it's, it's that, you know, the cliche kind of fortune favors the brave. I guess also the stupid, and um, I, you know, I think there's in the creative in this creative world of ours, one has to kind of be this kind of like idiot, this naive kind of person, because people are always going to tell you that you can't do that, and this is, you know, it's not possible, and we've heard this before. So this is just a top up, you know. I'm just this talk of mine is just a top up of for what you already know that if you take the risk, if like whether it's in an ad agency and the guy who's the the ad agency boss who's, who knows all of creativity is like, doesn't work, huh? that's not the way. You just go, you know what, let me show you. And also don't be scared to quit. Um, you might, it might not work out. You might kind of walk out of the thing and on your first walk out, you actually get hit by a bus and die. Or you could discover the greatest experience of your life, but you'll never know until you say, you know what, fuck it, I'm out. So yeah, that was, that was, me in a nutshell, in a nutshellish, a nut, a nutshellish. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about that I'm not gonna, you know. Let's go to the questions. Let's open up the lines, ladies and gentlemen. Take it away, Daniel. Man, DJ that was. So that was <laughs> I don't think I've shed so many tears on a Friday morning before in any one of these events. Like, and like just to kind of get a little snippet into the life of 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 Kakiso and like. To, to Phil's point, like having a little history lesson as well about South Africa, but also in a fucking funny way as well. Like I'm still, I'm still kind of crying and, and man, that was so epic. It was so, so epic. I'm definitely going to have to go rewatch a couple of episodes of Pio Monate so I can, so I can get myself back into that character because man, you see, you spoke so much truth about like my upbringing, like, and like what I remember um, bringing up to like going to school and having all these interactions with all these different humans and stuff. So, man, that was that was a solid, solid talk. Thanks so much for your for your um, yeah for like a, your vulnerability as well, man. Like to kind of um, bring us into your life and and in a funny, funny way. But yeah, so guys, if there's any questions, um, yeah, sweet man. If there's any questions, um, please feel free to to type them in the chat or or open up your mic and and take the stage happy to to hand that over to anyone somebody said so shareable oh yeah yeah maximilian kaizen oh yeah that's a german name that's a very german kind of maximilian oh yeah is a german maximilian kaizen that's a yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, max has usually got a question cool. for us so. hey maxi Hey, Kaki, so, oh my gosh, dude, but what?
a dose of vibes and mojo and like a, a big kick in the pants for Friday morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you, dude. What an cool. incredible story. Yeah, and, and as Dan was saying, just being able to, to refresh uh, Piemonate again, being able to, to get that, that context again and being able to, to get a sense of where it was born. Holy cow, right? Yeah, wow. well, I mean, that was, yeah, I guess that's like, you, you know, the, the kind of thrust was that, you know, a bunch of comedians, you know, to doing these comedy shows and then the, the idea of how do we, can we turn that into sketches and, you know, and pushing yeah. as hard as we could, but also that it hadn't been done in a way in South Africa. It was like a new yes. thing. So saying comedy sketch to people was like an unknown. People are like, you talking about you know SABC imagine back in 90 late early 2000s and uh, they you know that idea wasn't clear until Fred Joe I guess also took a risk on us and we made these sketches myself and David Cow at the top of his show because uh, instead of a, a monologue we used to write him a monologue but then we also said let's throw in sketches in there and then that became I think where SABC were like oh we see what you mean and at the time also SABC was great I mean SABC historically if you look at South African creativity at least in television um it actually was it, it's been the most sort of radical and forward moving like across the board I think like now if you if you judge it by what they're doing now it's kind Same. of like yeah, yeah what are we talking about but you realize that over the years they have been like the most the the landmarks or the milestones were mostly the creative ones were mostly from there you know debate shows comedy comedy shows that like that show user user that happened shows like the line you know a lot of Afrikaans tv that happened on okay. um, sabc too you know there's been like a lot of cool and also like smart stuff even if you think of the shows like remember the line it was like this post apartheid thing about violence with ip and all of that kind of stuff which won like a peabody awards okay. and all of that then there was there was the lab, which was made by Quizzical Pictures. We 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 they you know it was like a modern day newspaper. I mean I have I still don't see these kind of like cool, smart, progressive shows happening anywhere else. You know. Mm. How so? Quick, quick question, right? Because it feels like we've lost that that daring edge in terms of a lot of, and I don't know if it's you know you you created that icebreaker for, uh, you know, just listening to, to Trevor Noah this morning on podcast as I'm making the coffee, getting ready to listen to you as well. Just, you know, just without that Brian Eno, the musician, talks about um, the genius of a scene, so seniors, and it's that collision of so many bright people that creates that force that pushes through and draws down this brilliance that that sharpens people up and crystallizes stuff. And it's just feeling like we're, we're, we're flat at the moment and we need that, that oomph. Or, or are you seeing a different lens? Are you starting to see yeah. it coming together? I, I mean, I, feel, I was actually thinking about that yesterday, about like how some generations Maybe they remember, I mean, I don't know, you guys seem like you're more or less my age, late thirties, mid forties, whatever. And uh, like, so we, we kind of, we had this movement and this excitement, right? And then we, there's like a, we at a certain place now. And then I, I don't know, I, because we're missing that. We're not feeling any of it and we've done our thing or maybe we need to continue doing our thing. But also there's a, like a general sort of, depressedness creatively from the powers that be that exist there's like a lack of risk taking that exists maybe that's quite a downer and then the younger people that are coming up they don't seem to be to us at least i don't know if to them they're like oh my god what an amazing <laughs> time but, but 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 to us at least they 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 seems to be like it's a bit like oh man what are these people doing so i don't know if it's the sort of general malaise of a later generation towards a younger generation but i would say it would be great I, I also blame the powers that be. I feel like the people that are in the places of power who should be enabling, like, you yes. know, the Fed Joes who took a risk or the ladies at, at, um, 
at the um, uh, SABC who took a risk and all of those kind of things. I feel like they don't exist. I mean, Trevor, when he was leaving to America and uh, people were like, why would you do that? You're at the top of your game, China. Why would you do that? And then it was like, you know, the idea that, yeah, you can, he could leave, he could jump off and, and like land in like, a, like the rocky parts or he could land in the water. And luckily he landed in the water, you know, and it wasn't even luck. I think he had, but he knew what he was doing. And you still had people kind of being like, oh man, like kind of bummed that they're not on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. But you're like, yeah, but Jay Leno doesn't record in Ramberg, right? You do understand that mm. you have to kind of take a leap mm. before you can do the kind of thing, you know? So that was, that was bad. So I think that maybe through these talks or maybe something's going to happen, maybe the Roaring Twenties, as everybody's talking yeah. about, how, you know, this post-COVID Roaring Twenties that we're about to hit, maybe then where we've been introspective in our houses, we've been incubating and then and ideas and all that. And maybe when we come out, people are going to have like all sorts of crazy shit that's going to change the world. You know, it's, it's, it's a possibility that we hope for, or maybe it has happened and it, it is happening, but because we like the establishment now, we don't know. We just like, Oh, and the people are like, Oh, those establishment guys wait till they see us on the 17th of December, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Bring it. Oh no. It just, we, we need, cause it does feel, stuff feels derivative and it feels like we need more daring and, and, and real risk taking that you guys took. There was a lot at stake. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think so. I think it was fun because there was also no rules. There was, I remember the, the, the Pio Manato show had a disclaimer, you know, at the top, just because of the late night show kind of thing and the idea that it might be offensive. But in there, we got David Carr wrote the disclaimer last minute, right? Like, because we needed, it, it was such a, everybody's so young and, it, you know, you're just running around like headless chicken because you got to deliver the first episode. So David wrote the disclaimer that needed to go to the editors to put on and it had swear words in it, right? Like he was like, we don't give a fuck about da 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 which is like the going against a disclaimer period. And they let it go on air for like an entire season and there was on the first BCCSA complaint was like a year later, where, you know, in the second season, they had never picked it up and they just let it go. It was those types of things where there was like less supervision. So I guess things could go through the cracks, you know, and I guess as the more established we get, we kind of become more of a, like, you know, we have rules and maybe rules and established norms and maybe they help because that's the way but then it means that the new daring the new kind of daredevils have to be even more hardcore you know they have to be even more sort of groundbreaking because it, it's like we believe that there's a way to do things that we are also part of an international community that has standards that we also aspire to we're like oh it's like a cool way to be you know that's what they're doing in sweden so so <laughs> we we we, we try to, to impress that kind of world where the, the stuff we should be embracing maybe is the stuff that's like really raw and, un, you know, un, yeah, unformed in a way, but it's actually kind of the stuff that even Sweden wants to see, you know? So believing in that kind of shit. So many truths, so many truths. Uh, um, we got a quick question from Anais as well. Um, what are you working on now? So- um, oh, I've got a, a, like a really huge project that I can't talk about that you'll soon hear about it in the medias, in the papers. It's like cool. I mean, it's a thing. It's a very, it, you know, it's, you, you'll see it's a thing like that. But the most exciting, exciting thing that I, um, I, I just finished the script that I'd been working on for a couple of years. It, you know, it was, it was like a thing, kind of stop and start. And I, I finally finished it. I, 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 and I gave it around to people. And they, they were so like, you know, they had that, whoa, which was a, a crazy feeling. I even gave the, the, if you go onto WhatsApp and then you put a GIF in GIFs, you type crying African, there's this kind of emotional old man who's like, <laughs> because of this feeling of joy or whatever, whatever's happening. So that was the, the emotion that I was feeling from all the reactions from the script. Um, recently, so I just finished that, and that's why I'm raising money to make that. Um, uh, apart from this other crazy project that's going to be announced soon, um, uh, and yeah, and, and and another and a TV show, and we're building up another TV show uh, uh, for like global streamers and so on. So it's exciting. It's just been like also crazy, a crazy year of 
development. In one way, like last year, what was a bummer is we spent like a, a whole year writing Queen Sono at a huge cost. It was actually the most amount I've ever been paid to write a thing that would never saw the light of day, you know? And it was also, I, I think, the first time a South African TV show had that much time. So it was, it's a quite a bummer that it wasn't going to be seen because by the time we could make it, it was also late, like it, that you, you kind of, you, as they say with Netflix, there's so much churn that, that people see so many shows that, yeah, if we started shooting it, we would have started like two, three months ago, but it would only come out somewhere in 2022. And then it, it wasn't like, you know, stranger things in terms of like how it went around. It, it was very successful, but there's, so for the size of show it was, people, it, it, it would only kind of have its core audience and then everybody else would be like, oh, remember the show? What was this about again? So that was then the, the challenge. But then maybe we, we do another take at it in a different way or kind of re, reboot it. Or maybe we show you this other show that we're making that you guys are going to be very excited about as well. So we'll see. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. And I'm coming to see what this is going to be like. I'm going to keep my eyes on the headline reading society for, for the next time. <laughs> Kachiso's name pops up. Um, but yeah, they got, we've got a couple more cues here um, from Jade. Do you still try and check out local comedy shows? How do you feel about that current space? Is it moving or do you see a gap for more? Um, repeat the first part. I heard the last comedy show. Repeat that. Yeah. Uh, do you still try and check out local comedy shows? And how do you feel about that current space? And if there's any gaps for more? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's like, I guess now when I started stand up, I knew every comedian by name. I'd probably even been to their kitchens or in their cars driving. You know, the, for me, the C Cape Town was my kind of comedy birth. It's my comedy birthplace in terms of stand up. And it was always, I always thought that there was a, a general sensitivity. I think Cape Town, I'm not to say that Joburg is not, but I feel like as a creative incubation space, Cape Town is nicer, at least for me, you know, there's a, like, there was a lot more happening with Joburg had a very like, I bet, like comedy club, I was drinking beer, that's Murala. So it was very different, you know, there was a little bit more of a cerebral kind of way in Cape Town versus Joburg. Uh, but now it's like a crazy space that's kind of, open. it's a lot more commercial. I think maybe Cape Town had a benefit of, you know, when we were in Cape Town, we would hear like Mark, um, Martin Jonas just did the first hundred thousand bucks in a month, you know, at the time, back in the early nineties, you mid nineties or late nineties. And then you're like, what? Yeah, this guy, he did comedy, like in corporate, he did corporate, he did this and that. And he actually made a hundred thousand in one month from just telling jokes. We were like, whoa. So Joburg was that kind of place, very like highway, whereas Cape Town was a lot more thoughtful and all of that kind of stuff, you know? So, but now I'm, um, uh, I've been into Joba comedy clubs. I think it's a bigger space. There's like guys where you get to a club and there's like amazing, an amazing comic that you never heard of before. Like you, so it's that kind of place now where it's a real career. It's a real, it's like music, you know, you see like a great musician, but they're not going to be you two particularly because you two is already there. But when, when you go to like a jam, you see really amazing musicians, but it's a lot more sort of competitive and, you know, it's, I guess, the, the grandest risk taker, the ones, you know, somebody's going to love the one guy more because of his left dimple and he's going to have the thing and that's going to be his secret, you know, and he's going to be this huge superstar, but now you can, you can be that kind of huge superstar. Now it's a lot more common to make a hundred thousand rand a month, you know, well, obviously the pandemic has made it interesting that you, you're not in the comedy clubs anymore. It, it, it's on and off but also the virtual people are doing virtual comedy shows. Um, uh, corporations are still, corporates are paying for that kind of thing. So it's weird. But yeah, I mean, Loiso, I shot, I shot Loiso Gola's um, latest special at the Zeitz, at the Zeitz Mocha um, and learning. And it was like, for me, that was like exciting to kind of make like a very cinematic presentation of stand up, you know? And he, he, he's living, now he's back in the UK and he's kind of like riding the wave of that special. And for me, that was the kind of, I was like, this is the kind of stand up that I think is of the time because it's kind of telling the smart story. And, you know, it's not this kind of gag a minute, which is great, but I feel like the world has moved on to like a lot more smarter 
kind of talks, you know, like great, interesting, you know, themes in that in that way. So, so that was a great thing to 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 experience. Um, uh, not to say that classic stand up that's still kind of like, you know, is not like there's no value in that. That's also still beautiful. But you see, like, like Dave Chappelle drop like a poignant eight minutes on on YouTube where he's saying something, you know. So. Yeah, so I guess my when I go into comedy clubs, I go, I I look for that, you know. So the comics that take those kind of risks, a lot more personal, a lot more sort of, yeah, there's just a lot smarter kind of something to say about the world that's exciting. But and I think it's happening, you know. So I think when those guys get their break and their crack, then we'll also and they meet the other ones who are doing that in the world of film or in the world of design or in you know then we'll see this kind of movement happening um, it was quite unfortunate um uh, uh, the writer Pumlani Piccoli I was going to work on a story with him um uh, well we were going to adapt one of his books um his uh, Casey Lodeca winning sort of um uh, 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 book into a TV show and then he passed away, you know, like depression and all of that kind of stuff. But for me, that kind of guy was a kind of movement. You know, I, I thought that he was, and then even the lead from my film, Matuetue, where I thought I discovered this guy, he was doing like, you know, he's this great actor. And then, oh, then he got killed for his phone coming out of the movie. And when I went to Pretoria to his funeral, it was like this thing of um, uh, a movement, you know, it was like, I discovered him just from my piece of the world, but he had like a movement of real unbelievable creatives that were happening. They even had found a space, they have a theater, like an old like fire station that they turned into a performance space. And you're like, whoa, like on the, the sort of verge of the night, like before he gets buried, there was this event that just kind of happened and all these creative, and you're like, wow, there's unbelievable energy. Like it's, it's that kind of move, but it's happening in Pretoria at these, similar type of things happening all over the country, you know? So that's what I'm saying. I, in my world, I just discovered this kid, but in his world, he was like a primary thing. You know, he was the like, wow, this is like a king of the movement, you know? So it's, I think maybe it's also up to us to keep an ear out and give opportunities to people where you can, if you can, you know, those kind of things, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's great, like, kind of where comedy has come today with, like, the, the whole international stage and everything. But I must say, like, I would have loved to have been fully immersed in the culture back then, like, in the early 90s, where things were kind of, like, starting up. And it's, like, kind of getting into underground hip-hop and listening to Talib Kweli and Public Enemy. And then, like, there's only a couple cats at the show, and they're all familiar with them. So, oh, man. Anyway, oh, man. I would that's, have... that's exactly, I mean, that's what's crazy is what you're saying, Dan, is that. It's, like, it was exactly like that. And everybody was coming in, like listening to Talib Kweli, Black Star. Yeah. <laughs> we were swapping, like we were swapping Eddie Izzard DVDs, you know, Chris Rock, Black Star. You oh, know, yeah. It was like crazy. It was that kind of vibe. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. We got another. I think it's one more question here. Yeah. Oh wait, we might have another one. Okay, but anyway, I, we got one more question here, um, and it's from Anelia. Bichari, I think in that right. But thanks for such a great conversation. Was there a point where you gave up or slash almost gave up on an idea and how did you overcome this? Um, that's, there's, so that's my thing is I never give up on ideas. That's my, I think people kind of go, they think I'm crazy. I, I, I keep on going, I go back to ideas. Like this film that we did in 20, that came out in 2019 called Matwetwe. I actually wrote it on a notebook. Um, um, in 1996, 1997, when I was at university. And it was that same piece of paper that I pulled out and took, I started workshopping a script from, you know, Pure Manhattan Show was four years that from the idea, every day thinking that it's gonna happen tomorrow. I've got a, a, a comedy, a sitcom, well not sitcom, a comedy series that I think, it's one for me, every time I think about it, I, I chuckle, I get excited. I talk to people about, I pitch it still, like at the highest of like streamings and studios. And it still continues to be like a bit too edgy for people to pick on, you know, to pick up or to be, you know, especially when you go, I'm gonna speak to Africans and let's make it. And then you realize it's a bit too expensive to for SABC or somebody to pay for this thing and do it properly. And then 
um, uh, you take it to Americans, you talk to some like the big names out there, and then they're like, mm, it's great, we love it, but we fucking, this is brilliant, but it's too, we can't be, we are, we are American, we can't be seen to become, you know, because it's this kind of edgy African idea, or that's at least how they see it. And I think eventually, if it does come up and come, I, even if I get one season of that show and it's like, okay, that was it, it'll be out of my system. And I always say that to people, to creatives, I'm like, even if you, if it's a short, you know, if it's a movie and you're like, yeah, I'll do a test, do like a, like a, a, a sizzle or a, a short version of it. And then at least you might have it out of your system. But if, if the thing also will speak, because once you do it as a short film, then it also demands its space, you know, then, you know, it, you say, hey, I've got the long script of this thing. And then people are like, oh, now we can see it. Or you make it and you realize that it was a piece of shit, but you, you did it, you got it out of your system. Because until you get out of your system, it's always gonna be there, you know? So that's that's my thing, is like, I, I never throw away ideas, like ever, kind of, that's, yeah. Awesome, thanks so much. Oh man, that was, this was so epic. I think we've kind of um, come to a close this morning. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap up with that last question. I don't see any more pressing questions, but I mean, yeah, seeing a couple of people drop off here, but it's been such a great place to like share these these experiences and these stories. And I just wish everyone a great weekend. Like I'm gonna go away with like a smile on my dial and lots to think about. And it's just great to kind of, yeah, kind of like revisit history and, and listen to it through Kakiso's lens or, or I don't know if that make, kind of makes sense there, but thanks everyone. Thanks Kakiso, like you're epic bro. I can't wait to see what's coming in the future. And man, thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Good night. Goodbye. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Sweet, guys. <laughs> Bye.